All right, good morning once again. And please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And we're looking at this chapter this morning about ordinances. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And look with me, please, at verse 1 and 2. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. I think to start with this morning, we should probably define exactly what an ordinance is and go back to our Old Testament to Exodus chapter number 12. You know, the city that you live in has city ordinances, and um, there's one particular ordinance that, well, I think this is a national ordinance about uh, whether or not you have to take vaccines. There's an ordinance, right? And a lot of people know that ordinance now. So an ordinance is like a law. It's something that's to be observed and something to be kept. But back in Exodus chapter number 12, just look with me at verse number uh, 24 and 25. Exodus 12, of course, is the Passover night. And here's what the Lord said through Moses. Ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Now remember what God told him was on uh, every year at this month, on this day of the month, this will be your Passover feast and you'll kill a lamb and you will remember that on this night that God delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, remember? And so he calls it here in verse 24, an ordinance. And then verse 25, and it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service that ye shall say? It is the service of the Lord's Passover. So you notice that an ordinance is called a service. And in another place, in fact, in the next chapter, it's called a memorial. Okay, something to remember back. And they would do this collectively. They would come in. They would all when they would once they would get into the land that was promised to them, they would all come back into Jerusalem, their capital, and they would collectively remember that night <clears throat> that God freed them from the Egyptians. That was their service, okay? There was a sacrifice made. There was a memorial made. They remembered, and they kept it like a law. They kept it as an ordinance. All right, then. So in our text, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, when Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, <clears throat> this was the very thing that Paul was talking about at the end of chapter number four before he started talking to the Corinthians about ordinances. And uh, you can see that. You can look back to the end of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number four. And in verse number 17, he said, I'm going to send Timothy to you who shall bring you in remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And then you know what happened after chapter four? Paul began to talk about ordinances. He began to talk about ordinances which had been delivered to them a long time ago. And he talked about um, in Chapter number five, he talked about fornication, not that they were ordained to do it, but they were ordained to flee it and not to do it. And in chapter six, he's talking about it again. And in chapter number seven, he's talking about it again. And um, he's talking about husbands and wives in chapter number seven. And then in chapter number eight, he's talking about the ordinance of not eating things sacrificed to idols in chapter number nine, he gives himself as an example of what to do with your Christian liberty. And then in chapter 10, he's talking about the ordinance of not taking things sacrificed to idols. Now, where did he ever get the idea? Let's do a little research back to Acts chapter number 15. When Paul finished his first missionary journey, he came back home 
and got into a little conflict with some folks that came from Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit said to Paul, go up to Jerusalem and settle this matter about the gospel that I've given to you. And so Paul went up to Jerusalem, uh, declared his gospel. And once he did that, and the apostles accepted it, and they said, there's just something that we would like for you to do. We want to give you some ordinances, things that um, while you're out there ministering to the Gentiles and you run into Jews, if you don't want to offend them while you're ministering to them, here are some things that you should keep. And they are found in Acts chapter number 15, verse number 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from meats offered to idols. Sound familiar? Now you know where Paul got it and why he belabored it so much in the church at Corinth. And from blood and from things strangled, and from fornication. Now, you know why Paul dealt with that so much also. Two things that he didn't deal with so much. He didn't deal with um, eating blood, and he didn't deal with things strangled. He didn't talk about those to the Corinthians, at least not in these epistles. Maybe he did face to face. In fact, I'm sure he did, because after he left this conference, in chapter 16 and verse number 4, this is the beginning of the second missionary journey. Look what happens in 16.4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Okay, so he was faithful to declare those things. And what was one particular place that you know was on Paul's list of places to go to in his second missionary journey. It was Corinth, right? In chapter 18. Just two chapters later in the book of Acts, he goes to Corinth for the first time. He teaches them the gospel. He baptizes them in water. He teaches them about the Lord's Supper. He teaches them about um, how to avoid fornication he teaches them how not to eat things sacrificed to idols. And then once he leaves that place and he writes back to them, he says, those things that I delivered unto you before, here's what I'm going to tell you about them again. All right. Now back in our text then at uh, 1 Corinthians 11. By the way, did you notice when we were back there in Acts chapter number 15 that the Jewish apostles at Jerusalem, that they didn't have any ordinance for water baptism and the Lord's Supper. They didn't mention at that conference water baptism, and they didn't mention the Lord's Supper. Now, those of us who've been Baptists for longer than we can remember, what is it? that Baptist churches always teach are the two ordinances of the church. Water baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? And by the way, I don't disagree that those are ordinances. I believe that they are, but I, the point I'm making is that the Jerusalem apostles did not tell Paul to baptize his converts. And they did not tell him anything about the Lord's Supper. I don't even know if they were observing it. I don't know if they were or not. Uh, I would have, I could be convinced one way or the other with scripture verses, but right now I don't know. Uh, maybe if you know, you can you can clue me in. But uh, now here's the thing: Paul did practice both. Uh, you know, from the time he came to Corinth, uh, when they got saved, he baptized them. In fact, when he wrote First Corinthians, he told the names of some that he did baptize. So he did practice water baptism, not because it was given to him by the apostles at Jerusalem, but in reflection of his own gospel. He did baptize folks in water. And he never stopped to practice, that I can tell. A lot of uh, dispensational teachers will say he stopped or he had a revelation that he should quit or something like that. I've never found that verse. I don't know where that verse is. 
I don't believe it's in the Bible. And uh, some smart guy told me it was in between the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next. Ha ha. Very funny. And uh, but what about the Lord's Supper? Well, when Paul talks about it here in chapter 11, you'll see that he said, I delivered unto you that which was given to me. He tells it just like he told the gospel. He said, I've given it to you already. I'm going to tell you about it again. So let's look at it. I don't know if we'll be able to finish this chapter this morning. Maybe not. But if we don't, that's okay. Here's, um, here's a couple of more ordinances. When Paul said, keep the ordinances uh, as I delivered them to you, let's look at a few that we know that he delivered already. 1 Corinthians 7.17 Here's an ordinance, and I'll read verse 16 as well. 1 Corinthians 7, 16, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches." He said that everywhere he went, every one of his churches, he told them that. And uh, if they were married, he told them not to seek to be loosed. If they were already loosed from a husband or wife, he would tell them uh, not to seek to be married. Just uh, for the present distress, he taught them that. That was a church ordinance. So when he tells them, keep the ordinances, I'm not going to ignore this one. And I'm not going to say there's only two ordinances for the church. I'm going to keep that one right there too, shouldn't we? Agree or disagree? Amen. That's an ordinance to keep. Here's another one in chapter 9, verse number 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, by the way, did Paul do it or did he not? <laughs> he did. He did live of the gospel. He just didn't take any offerings from Corinth. He didn't, uh, he didn't practice that ordinance in Corinth. He did other places. And other churches supported him, and he did live of the gospel. He also lived of his tent making, at least in Corinth and maybe some other places as well. But uh, that's an ordinance. And by the way, that's a church ordinance. It's not just a, a gospel minister that needs to know that and observe that. It's a church that needs to know that. Amen. So there's some ordinances. And here's another one. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works is an ordinance that we should keep. Agree? We should do good works. God has ordained it. We should keep that ordinance. Okay, so uh, I'm not against saying there's ordinances for the church of baptism and the Lord's Supper, but I'm not going to throw out these other ones in the meantime. You see my point? Also, Romans chapter 13, and the first couple of verses, Paul tells the Romans that government is ordained by God. And while... Whether you observe that or whether you don't, God's still going to ordain government. He's still going to have a, a ruler over top of you, whether you like him, whether you hate him, whether you pray for him or her. God ordains government. And then here's one more. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 5. Titus 1, 5 says, uh, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Titus was to ordain elders in every city. Do we still ordain ministers today? Yes, we do, and yes, we should. I think that's one that ought to be kept also. All right, are there any ordinances that we do not need to keep that are mentioned in the Bible. Well, how about the ordinance of Passover that we talked about first? When are you going to celebrate that? 
That was an old ordinance, right? But when are you going to celebrate? Are you going to observe the Passover? Nope, you're not. And uh, what about all those Old Testament ordinances? Are we to observe them? What does your New Testament tell you in Colossians chapter 1, verse, or sorry, Colossians 2.14? Let's have a look there. Some ordinances that we do not, we're not obligated to observe. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? If you go back to Leviticus chapter number 11, man, there's a lot of ordinances back there about fish and animals and whether or not you can eat rabbits or squid or pork chops and all of that. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Those are ordinances that we don't have to give regard to today. We're not under the law. We're not Jews, and we're not given clean versus unclean animals in our dispensation at all. If you can catch it and cook it and stomach it, then help yourself. <laughs> that sounded delicious, didn't it? All right, back to our chapter then. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and that the head of the woman is the man, and that the head of Christ is God. Let's start with the last one first, because that's the one that gives most Christians trouble. How in the world would the Bible say that the head of Christ is God? Is it true that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are equal? Is it true when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, that they are one God? Isn't it true? Now, how is it that the Bible would say this, that the head of Christ is God? In the matter of subjection, no doubt, um, and in obedience, the Bible tells us over there in Philippians chapter number 2 that in verse number 6 that Jesus Christ did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. No robbery. You know what robbery is. As where somebody um, you know, comes in your house and sticks a knife up to your throat and says, give me your wallet, give me your purse, give me the crown jewels or whatever it is that they want to take, that's robbery. They're forcing you to give up your, your cell phone or whatever, okay? That's a crime. That's a crime anywhere in the world, okay? But what potentially, what would you be guilty of if you were claiming to be part of the Godhead? You would be taking something from God. You would be taking his deity for yourself and applying it to yourself, that's exactly what the chief priest thought was wrong with Jesus when he said, tell us plainly if you are the son of God. And he indicated that he was. And he said, you're guilty of blasphemy because you've taken God's deity for yourself. And he said to the people, what do you think? They said he's guilty of death. He's worthy of death. Put him to death for it because he's taken God's deity to himself and him being just a man. Well, you know that he wasn't just a man. Hmm. He was God. And so the Bible says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So as being equal with God, he was not taking anything from God the Father to himself that didn't belong to him already. No robbery. No crime, no harm done, right? No robbery. But what did he do? Made himself of no reputation and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. 
He took upon him the form of a servant. He was God, but he took upon him the form of a servant, even though he was God. And when he humbled himself, he was found in fashion as a man and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All right. So when you read in your Bible here that the head of Christ is God, you understand that's for purposes of submission and obedience to the collective will of God. When I say collective, I mean the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They agree completely that what Christ will do is humble himself and become a man, even though he's equal with the other parts of the Godhead. And he, in his flesh, in his body of flesh, will be the one to die for our sins. Agree? Amen? Amen. All right, then. So now the rest of the verse says, in verse 3, I'd have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Now think of a home for a minute. Think of a home where there's a father that knows the Lord, there's a wife that knows the Lord, and they have Christ in their home. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man. All right, that's the order that God put in the home. All right? We're not going to, we're not going to look to the world. We're not going to look to education. We're not going to look at bad examples. We're going to look at God's Word. And take this as our pattern. Amen. And do our very best. Even if we fall short, we will do our very best that this will be our pattern. Amen. Those of you that don't have a home yet, you're not married, say, as God is my witness today, I want my home to be this way. I want, I want Christ to be the head of my husband, and I want my husband to be my head just as the head of Christ is God. God, Christ, husband, wife. That's God's order for the home. All right? Now, there are some things that Paul wanted to address about that. In verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But, but every woman that praying or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all as one as if she were shaven. Now notice in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonoreth his head. That is, if he has this head covered, he dishonoreth his head. His head is Christ. When he covers his head, when he is uh, praying or prophesying, he's dishonoring to Jesus Christ. You see, I don't understand why. You will in a minute. I promise you. And the woman, he says in verse 5, that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even at all as if she were shaven. Now, you know what it means to shave. Some of us men, most of us men, I think today before we, before we came here, we shaved our face. We didn't shave our head. I don't think anybody here did that. But one could do that, right? All right, now here is talking about uh, being shaven. In verse 6, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Of course, shorn is... a uh, Old word that we don't use an awful lot anymore, but it's just like to be shaved, all right? To have her head, to have her hair shaved off. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, why is it that you're thinking of hair? Well, number one, because he mentioned a head, and he mentioned shaving, and he mentioned being shorn. Now, if you'll look at verse number 15, you'll understand it perfectly. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. What kind of hair? Long hair is her covering. That is, when she has long hair, 
her head is completely covered, right? It's not talking about putting on a veil or an umbrella or, well, you don't put an umbrella on your head though, do you? <laughs> but you know, some places in the world, they wear bonnets, the women do, as a head covering. I'm not being critical of that, but I'm telling you, that the woman, if she has long hair, number one, that's her glory, and number two, that is her covering. Her head is covered by her hair. Now, why is it important? Let's start with the man. Verse number four. Every man, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. That's God's rule. That's God's ordinance. I'm not going to argue with it. It's just the way that God put it. If he's not to cover his head, but the woman is to cover her head, how is the woman's head covered? With hair. So the man is not to cover his head like a woman covers her head. He's not to have long hair like a woman. Now I know there's a lot of confusion in the world, but we're Christians and we have a Bible. And we can read. Let's read uh, Revelation chapter, Revelation 9, 7. Okay? Revelation 9, 7. In, in chapter 9, hell is opened. Okay? And some really nasty creatures come up out of the pit. Revelation chapter 9. And then it says in verse number uh, 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of, what's that? Uh, faces of men, all right? And they had hair as the hair of women. Now think about it. The face of a man and the hair of a woman. Now you knew exactly what I meant when I said the face of a man, didn't you? Now what is the hair of a woman? You know. You know. It's long hair. What else could it mean? If it said the hair of a woman, it's not talking about a certain color because women have all different colored hair. Right? If you go around the world, primarily, women have blonde hair. In Germany, for example. Uh, if you go to America, they have purple hair. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not a natural color. But the uh, hair can be brown or black. It can be red or, or uh, you know, some combination thereof. Okay. So there. Now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 about the man, in verse number 4, that uh, he is not to dishonor his head by covering his head. That's clear enough, isn't it? It's a dishonor to God. We're going to see why in just a moment. Verse number 5, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even as all as if she were shaven. In other words, when she is uncovered, she dishonors her husband. If the man dishonors Christ with his head covered, then the woman dishonors her husband with her head uncovered. That's what it says, isn't it? Verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if that if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, it's not too common for women to shave off all of the hair of their head. There's a few crazy people in the world. But sometimes there's a medical necessity. Understood, right? Chemotherapy, yeah, because... Uh, Generally, one will lose their hair anyway when they're having chemotherapy, and some choose to go ahead and shave it off before it starts falling off, right? We understand that. That's very understandable. Okay? But uh, generally speaking, a woman likes to have her hair. Now, I can't speak from experience because I've never been one. But I think, generally, women like their long hair, right? I think so. Maybe I'm wrong. But I believe so. And it is. it says it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. And it says, let her be covered. All right. Now, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is, notice the two things, 
He is the image and the glory of God. You see that? There's two things that the man is, and the reason why he should not have long hair is because he's in the image of God, and he is God's glory. That's the way that God glories in him when he has short hair in the image of God. Now it says, but the woman is the glory of the man. So here's the man with short hair, and he looks at his wife who has long hair, and he says this, as he introduces her, he says, this is my glory. This is the more beautiful part of me. She's more beautiful. Look at her. The man is just a man, you know. I mean, look at his fingernails. He's got dirt under his fingernails. He's been biting the sides of his fingers. The woman has her fingers all pretty and everything like that. And she's got her long, beautiful hair that she shampooed about 14 different times and with 14 different conditioners. And, you know, and she smells good and she looks good and he's just there. Right? Mm -hmm. She's the more beautiful part of the, of the couple. Right? They're one flesh, but she's the better part of the flesh. <laughs> she's the better looking part. So she's the glory of the man. That's what the Bible says right there, right? The woman, the man, uh, sorry, verse number seven, he is in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Verse eight, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. What's that a reference to? The man is not of the woman. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Who came first? I'm not going to say the chicken or the egg. <laughs> Who came first, the man or the woman? The man came first. And Eve was taken out of man. Verse 9, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God took out Adam's rib and made Eve from that rib. You say, that sounds weird and crazy. Well, he made Adam out of dirt. So which is better, a rib or a clot of dirt? Take your pick. Okay. But notice in verse 9, the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now, verse 10, and by the way, that's just God's law. If you, if you fight against it, if you argue with it, you're just arguing with God's word. Good luck in your life. <laughs> you're going to have a hard time, whether you're man or woman. Whether you're man or woman. Just take what God gives you and live with it and do the best with it. Amen? Verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, the strangest verse in the passage is probably the one that's the most important. Power on her head. So the long hair of a woman is her covering, and it represents that she has power on her head. That she has power on her head. Whenever the husband does not follow God's ordained Head, when the husband does not follow Christ, his ordained head, what happens? Well, if he doesn't follow the Lord, then he follows his heart. He follows demonic influences. He follows the devil. He follows the flesh. He follows the world. If the woman doesn't follow her God-ordained head, which is her husband, then they're both guilty of dishonoring their respective heads. And they open themselves up to Satan's angels. When it says angels, I don't think those are God's angels there in verse number 10. Because of the angels. I don't think God's angels are going to cause you any harm. But Satan's angels are wanting to cause you harm. And they're looking for, number one, rebellion and non-submission to the proper authority so that they can replace the proper authority. If a husband doesn't want to follow the Lord, maybe he'll follow a devil. Maybe he'll follow the doctrines of a devil. If a woman doesn't want to follow her husband, maybe she'll follow an evil spirit. 
You say, that's, that's hard to hear. It's medicine that we need to take. It's something that we need to know. You don't hear it preached on too often, but there's a warning right there in the middle of that page, because of the angels. Now, what does the Bible say that it's no wonder that people can be deceived by ministers because Satan himself transforms himself into what? Fill in the blank. A what? An angel of light. Satan transforms himself into an angel. And the first man and the first woman got into trouble when the woman had a conversation with somebody that she really shouldn't have conversed with. I don't believe for a minute this, that Eve should have conversed with the devil. And I believe, I can't prove it to you 100%, but I know that the Bible says that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. I believe when she looked at the serpent, he was transformed as an angel of light. And she had a conversation with him that her husband was not part of. And what happened to her? Well, she ended up in a mess. She ended up deceived by that angel of light. She ended up deceived. She ended up being tricked. There she was trying to tell the devil of all people how it is what God wanted them to do and what he did not want them to do. And she didn't have the details right. It's easy for us to pick on Eve now after all these thousands of years, isn't it? But she didn't have the details right, did she? She did not have the story right. And she did not also have her husband there to say, will you please tell him what God said? Would you please? I think that would have been honoring to her husband. And I think that would have been honoring to God. And I think that she would not have ended up deceived if she had let her husband help her. I believe that. But that's 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, by the way. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel, angel of light. So instead of going to her husband, she made herself a spokesman for the family in the place of her husband and wound up deceived. Now, what should the woman's hair show? Just look at verse number five, if you would. I'm going to give you a quick list here. Verse number five. The woman's hair would show, number one, that she is honoring her husband. All right? If she prays with her head uncovered and she dishonoreth her head, the opposite of that is that she's covered and she shows honor to her husband, right? That's number one. Number two, in verse number six, that she does not want to bring shame to herself, her husband, or her Lord. If she has long hair, she's saying, I don't want to be ashamed of myself, I don't want to be ashamed of my husband, and I do not want to bring shame upon the Lord. I'll be in submission to my husband as he's submitting to the Lord. And then number three, in verse number seven, that she is not her husband's image, but his glory. She doesn't look just like him. She doesn't look. She's different. She has the hair of a woman. He has the hair of a man. And she is his glory because of it. She's more beautiful than him, all right? It's not a drawback. It's a benefit. She's not his image, but his glory. Verses 8 and 9, you'll find number 4. By wearing her long hair, she's showing that she came from man and was created for the man. And Genesis chapter 2 will back that up. And uh, you remember that God said, it's not good for man that he should be alone, right? And I'll make a help meet for him. And so uh, God made Eve to be a help for Adam. So she came from man and was created for the man. And then number 5 in verse number 10 
Her hair will show, her long hair will show that she's under the power of her husband, which is her head. Okay. All right, then in verse number uh, 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely? And uh, that word means um, fitting or proper. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Nature teaches that a man will be ashamed when he has long hair. And nature teaches it. It's a natural, it's a natural reaction. If your hair grows long, it's a shameful thing. And uh, by the way, over there in Revelation that we just read a minute ago, in Revelation chapter 9, what were those creatures that come up out of the pit? They're demonic creatures that have the face of a man and the hair of a woman. Now the last thing in the world that I want as a Christian man is to look like a devil. And the devil has the face of a man and the hair of a woman. And, and uh, God forbid... If I get so old that I can't go to the barber shop, before you put me in that casket, you make sure you cut my hair, okay? <laughs> I don't want to go to the grave looking like a devil. I want to look like a man. God made me a man. I'm going to look like a man. Amen. All right. So the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Verse number 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Okay. So it's a glory for one, it's a shame for another. And all of the gender blending that goes on in the world today, I'm not for it. I'm against it. And when you can't tell a man from a woman, when you cannot tell because of the hairstyle or the clothing style, something's wrong inside and something's wrong with their relationship to God and something's wrong and the danger is found in verse 10 because of the angels. The devil's angels are looking for any little crack or crevice that they can get into to exploit and destroy a life. They'll do it in an unbeliever. They'll do it to a believer. If a believer gets out of line with what he or she is supposed to be, here comes one of the devil's angels to exploit Amen. All right, then verse number 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither in the churches of God. Now, this only means one thing. It can't mean two opposite things. I had a long haired Pentecostal friend of mine one time try to tell me that, well, if you want to have long hair, Paul said, I won't be contentious with you. That's not what he's saying. What is he saying? Verse number 16. If a man seemed to be contentious, Paul's already stated, number one, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It's a shame for a woman to have short hair. That is our custom. That's what we teach in every church. And if anybody's contentious against that, we have no custom otherwise. We have no custom that's going to agree with the world. We have one custom. It's what God gave us. Long hair for a woman, short hair for a man. That's our custom. That's what we teach everywhere. He said it's neither in the churches of God that is anything different from that right there. Verse number 17, Now in this that I declare, I praise you not. You notice that when Paul started this chapter, in verse number 2, he said, I praise you, brethren. <laughs> And now he's changed his tune. And in verse number 17, he said, I praise you not. And then before he finishes the chapter, he says it again. He's still got some issues. We'll get into this just a little bit. Verse 17. In this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. 
that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. When you come together, that's what we're doing this morning, right? We're come together to hopefully we'll be better when we left than what, than what we were when we came here. Maybe you got offended by the haircuts. I don't know. I hope not. Isn't it interesting that God put a chapter in the Bible about haircuts? Isn't that interesting? Not only does God number the hairs of our head, He cares how long they are. That's interesting. Paul said in verse number 17, I've got something that I'm not going to praise you for. It's that when you come together, you come together and you're worse instead of being better. A church service ought to make you better. If you heard something that offended you, you can take it to heart and you can say, you know what? I needed that. <laughs> I needed to hear that even if it offended me. I've been in church services where I heard something that made my face turn red. I've been there. My face turned red. Because I was as guilty as could be. And when I went away, I said, I don't want that to happen again. I'm going to change my way so that I'll not be guilty when the preacher preaches on that next time. <laughs> That's what we should do. Amen. If God cares enough to put it in the Word of God for us to read it and, and learn it, then, then we ought to obey it. Amen. Amen. So Paul said, now this that I declare unto you, verse 17, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So you know already that the church at Corinth had divisions and heresies. You know that from the first couple of chapters. They had all these cliques and groups where one group said, well, we're from Paul. <laughs> Another group said, Apollos was our minister. And uh, somebody else said, ah, we're just, we're of Christ. We're more holy than both of you because we just belong to Christ. And they had these little cliques that didn't get along with each other. And Paul said, I don't like it. He said, you have your divisions, you also have heresies. And then he goes on to be a little bit more critical. In verse number uh, 19, he said, there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest unto you. Now here's something you'll find out in any local church. Once in a while, somebody will stand in a pulpit whether somebody from the congregation, hopefully not, but maybe, or somebody from the outside comes as a guest speaker. And uh, we don't know what they're going to say. We don't know what they're going to preach exactly. We don't ask them every little detail about what, what message they will preach. There might be some time, and there has been in the past, where somebody will stand here and declare something, maybe very forcefully, Something that's not true. They might even preach from the wrong version of the Bible. They may do it. It's happened here before. <laughs> we didn't like it, but we didn't throw any stones either. We tried to show some grace since we do believe in grace. Amen. <laughs> and we try to show grace in all things. Amen. Are there those that God approves of their doctrine and approves of what they're teaching? There are, aren't there? If they're teaching the Word of God purely and teaching right doctrine, they're approved. That don't mean they're perfect, but they're approved. And you know a church, a, a, a local church that is used to sound doctrine, they can discern when they're hearing something right and when they're hearing something wrong. I know you can. I know you can. If somebody stood up here and gave you a bunch of false things this morning, you'd say, I'm going to go home and study that because I don't think that's right. And you would come to the conclusion that what they taught was not right. 
I think that's what happened right here. For there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And you know, when Paul opened up this chapter, he said, I praise you that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. I praise you for that. I praise you for remembering me in all things. So they were doing some things right. They were remembering his doctrine. They had some people in the church or somebody very evidently came to them and told them, hey, Corinthians, there's no resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Paul said in chapter 15, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ isn't risen. And you're still in your sins. Somebody come in and tell a, a Christian church there's no resurrection of the dead. Why, he's done lost his marbles, hasn't he? And you would catch it. If somebody came in here and taught there's no resurrection of the dead, you'd sit there with a smile on your face and look like the just the perfect picture of Christian charity, but in your heart you would know that's not right. Amen? Amen. So that's verse number 19. Now look what he says in verse, uh, verse number 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. Now here he's, he's going to correct something that's wrong. He says, when you come together, what is it that you're doing? He said, what you're doing is everyone is taking before another. In other words, let me just put it in the context of our church right here. Last Friday night, we had, um, we had uh, lasagna <laughs> and cake, and it was my birthday dinner because uh, choir practice on Friday night, well, all the choir members joined me in celebrating my birthday. And so we had some really nice lasagna. And... Uh, well, imagine if we came here today and we were going to celebrate the Lord's table. We we're going to have communion. And just imagine that Brother Alvin and Sister Lele brought some of that really nice lasagna. And the only thing I had was a little dried fish. And I'd be looking at them like, I wish I had some of that lasagna. And here I'd be eating my little dried fish thinking, hmm. And they're looking at me like, ha. <laughs> Look at him. All he has is a fish. I bet he wishes he had some of this lasagna. <laughs> now, that'd be terrible, wouldn't it? And uh, imagine if uh, somebody had plenty to drink and somebody else didn't have anything. And they're just sitting there with an empty cup thinking, I wish I had some of that Coca-Cola. I wish I had a glass of that Sprite. What did Paul say? In eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Paul's saying, that right there is a mess. That is not what you're supposed to be doing. You're not, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He said it's not to do it. Okay, what was the Lord's Supper? If you go back to the Passover, the last Passover, where Christ sat down with his apostles, what did he do? They ate the Passover meal, which we learned from Exodus 12 a minute ago was what? It's a lamb that was slain, and they ate unleavened bread with it. They ate that Passover meal together. And then after the meal, Jesus did something. He took a piece of bread, and he took a cup. And he said, this bread which is broken is my body. And this cup is the New Testament in my blood. That was after the meal. See? Now when the Apostle Paul gives us what we are to observe, he says, it's not the supper, but it is the cup and the bread. That's it. The cup and the bread are not the supper. The grace brethren 
churches, a lot of them still do this today. They have what they call a threefold communion. Now, I'm not recommending what they do, but I'm going to tell you what they do to illustrate something. They have a threefold communion, as they call it. When you come in, you sit down, and the first thing that they will serve you, the church will serve you in a dish, some meat kind of stewed together with some unleavened pieces of bread. And it's all kind of in a, um, kind of in a, not a soup, but a um, gravy, kind of like a heavy gravy. And when you eat that stuff, you know, that unleavened bread kind of slinks down your throat. It's kind of slimy and it doesn't taste very good because it's unleavened. And it's just all mixed in with the meat. And they serve that meal. And after they serve that meal, they set those aside. And then they have the second fold part of their communion where they serve you a small piece of bread and a cup of juice like we do here. And when they're done with that second part, <laughs> you're going to be really shocked at this one, but I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you what they do. I've been to a couple of their services. After they finish the bread and the cup, they follow what it says there in the Gospels and they take their socks and their shoes off and they wash each other's feet. You know why they do that? Because Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And they believe that their communion ought to be threefold. And they kind of reenact the Passover meal and then they serve the bread and the cup and then they wash your feet for you. Okay. And... uh those folks believe in salvation by grace, through faith, without works, and they're saved, just like we are. They just have a different type of communion that we do. But you get the point that the meal, the Passover meal, where Jesus ate was different from when he gave the bread and the cup? It was. And you'll see that when you read the passages carefully. Now, what Paul says, he says, when you come together, this is not to eat the supper. It's not. And what you're doing by bringing one in front of another, bringing your meal and your stuff in your face and you're drinking until you get drunk and that other one doesn't have anything, he said, that's all wrong. He said, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Not, not, not. <laughs> now, what does he call it in the positive? In chapter number, number 10, he says, the the bread that we break and the cup that we bless <clears throat> is not the cup, the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread that we partake, is it not the body of Christ? <clears throat> or rather, is it not the communion of the, of the body? Excuse me. You can see that. Look back at chapter number 10, verse number 16. <clears throat> The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. So he said, all you need for your communion service, you don't need your supper. That's why when we come here on communion night, we do not have supper together. We save that for birthday parties. <laughs> or, Easter, or Easter meal. We do that. Or whatever occasion we can dream up to have a meal together. We like to eat because we're a Baptist, right? Amen. But he said, the communion is not your supper. That's why when we serve the communion, we serve a very small piece of bread that nobody in their right mind would ever call supper. And we serve a very small cup of juice that nobody would say, wow, I drank so much of that I got drunk. And it's unfermented anyway. Okay? It's not a supper. He said, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What is it then, Paul? Verse number 22, what, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? That's where you ought to eat your supper. Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? Notice the despise and the shame. What is the worst two things that you could put into a communion service where you have communion together, the communion of the body of Christ, that's us, and we all partake of the blood of Christ and receive the benefits of the forgiveness of sins. We all have our standing in Christ that we're seated in Christ with heavenly places. 
We all have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What in the world would be pictured by me gorging myself and you having the, the little dried fish? Well, I'd be the wrong picture altogether, wouldn't it? Be a terrible picture. So he said, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You don't have that big supper there. All right. And so Paul says at the end of verse number 22, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Notice that Paul said, that which also I delivered unto you. So he did tell them about the communion, didn't he? He did deliver it to them, just like he delivered the gospel in chapter 15. He said, I delivered that unto you before. And then notice also in verse 23 that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. It was a supper. It was at night that he took that bread and that he took that cup after the meal. By the way, over in um, Acts chapter 20, uh, hey, take a look there real quick. Acts chapter number 20. We've got just a couple of minutes here. We'll have a look. I believe that what you're looking at in Acts chapter 20 is or was a communion service. Paul's getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to depart. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, I don't know... Does it say what time they started? Man, you think I preached long? You would have, you would have pulled a Eutychus if you had Paul to preach to you. Verse eight, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, as. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Man, what a way to kill a service. I mean, what a way to kill a man. Um, who killed who here? <laughs> Did the preaching kill him? Man, that's tough. You imagine that scene? Guy's laying down there on the ground. His eyes are open, rolled back in his head. He's laying there, you know, not, not very pretty looking. Felt three floors. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him. Embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. Now, if that is a communion service, I'm assuming they came together maybe about, you know, early evening. They're planning to have communion service. And what happened was Paul preached for a long time. He preached till after midnight. So it's no longer the first day of the week. It's actually early Monday morning when they took their commute or when they broke their bread. If it's a communion service, they took it Monday morning. <laughs> and that's not a problem because Paul said back in our text here, if you'll look in verse number 24. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now there he didn't prescribe how often you have to take the Lord's table. He just said as often as you do it. In fact, he said it again in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Here's why that when Paul met with the disciples at Jerusalem, they didn't give him an ordinance for the Lord's table. 
This was revealed to him by the Lord himself. And the significance that was attached to it was not something that the disciples did there in Jerusalem. Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. It's to show the Lord's death. When we take the cup, we say this is the communion of the blood of Christ. Christ shed his blood to pay for our sins. We have the benefit of sins forgiven by the blood of Christ. We take the bread and we say his body was broken for us. In his body on the cross, he bare all of our sins. And now we're his spiritual body because he was sacrificed for us. And we have communion together and all of that. See? And so we show his death. Every time we do the communion and we sing that song that we sang just a little while ago, saved by the blood of the crucified one because we want to show his death amongst ourselves and anybody who might be walking by and listening. We're showing the death of Christ that it means something to us. It's the most important thing that Christ died for us. Amen. All right. I'm not going to be able to finish all but uh, notice at verse number 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So there's a way to take unworthily. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord. Now notice that, uh, number one, even though this is an ordinance of the church, the communion, and the church serves it, and they serve it in a way so that it's not confused with a meal and that there's no abuses like that which happened in Corinth going on. We serve it in, in a small format and we do it in a short order just to show the Lord's death and also why. What is it that the church does also not do? The church does not examine the individual. Who examines the individual whether he's worthy to partake? What does it say? Let a man examine himself. That's why, that's one reason why we do not have a closed communion. We do not say to a believer that belongs to another church, you cannot take the Lord's table. Why? We just say, let every man examine himself. And then let him take. I have to examine myself. You have to examine yourself. Is it an important matter? Yes, it is. For he that eateth, verse 29, and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. There's a way to do damage to yourself, and that is to uh, not to examine yourself and to take unworthily and to be guilty of the Lord's body. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, but when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord. Okay? So in other words, God says, if you don't, if you don't examine yourself, He said, I'm going to examine you. If you don't correct yourself, I'm going to correct you. So that's why it is an important time. When we think about what Christ did for us, that he died for us and paid for our sins, then the second thought ought to be, therefore, I don't want to live for sin. I want to live to glorify him. That's the purifying factor. Verse 33, Wherefore, my beloved, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. This communion is not to come and satisfy your hunger. Funniest thing I ever heard was one of my classmates in Bible school said that he was at a communion service one night. Some guy came in off the street and he looked up at the front and he saw that bread up there and he hmm, sat himself down. He was eyeballing, he was looking at those uh, 
cups of juice up there. And he thought it was the good kind of stuff, you know. He thought he was gonna he thought he was gonna have himself a little drink that night. And when the communion plate came around and the cup was passed around, he grabbed two and he went. Choop, choop. <laughs> he was gonna have himself a good time, you know. But that's not what it's for, right? He says, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. The condemnation that he's talking about, it's not the condemnation that sends a person to hell. Paul was clear about that in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We're never going to be sent to hell for anything that we do as a Christian. But there is a kind of a condemnation that he talks about here in the context where he said, some are, verse 30, weak, sickly, and many sleep. And that's the kind of condemnation that God brings on a believer that won't or that refuses to examine himself or herself at the communion. All right, so that's the chapter. We did make it, and uh, we, hey, we made it in time. So thank you for your patience and uh, for studying along with us. If you do have any questions about this material, please be sure to ask. I know it's a lot of material to cover. It's 34 verses. but um, So if you do have questions, be sure and let me know.